Say hello. If you don't know each other, introduce each other, exchange names. And now that you have your new best friend, share with this new best friend how your day was. Make sure you guys each get a turn, and I'll give you about 20 seconds. Go ahead. Don't think too much, just the first thing that comes to mind. And now share this time that upset you, the person next to you. Make sure you each get a chance. I'll give you 30 seconds. two questions to this last one. How did you feel just answering? Did you even answer the actual question? Could you feel yourself all of a sudden getting emotional? Maybe your heart started to race, or if you're like me, your hands get really grossly sweaty. <laughs> or maybe you were nervous or reluctant to answer in fear of what the other person was going to think or say about you. And maybe you felt nothing at all, and in that case, I might have nothing to share with you. But maybe this didn't resonate with you because you don't consider yourself politically active. And if that's the case, I encourage you to examine why. Is it because you already know the inherent emotional ties politics have and we all live in the 21st century, you got too much on your plate, forget it, don't even want to deal with it? Or maybe you have witnessed your more politically active friends really get into a heated debate and you've seen the emotional fury that can come out of it. Or maybe you have once or twice tried to chime in and you are either nervous yourself or even ridiculed for not knowing enough about the topic at hand. But here's another scenario that you may or may not resonate with. It's Thanksgiving, let's say 2013, I think that was a good year. And your entire family's in town. You have Uncle Joe that's coming in from Florida, Grandpa Bill is coming in from Chicago, and Aunt Becky is coming from Texas. And all their families are here under the same roof. The entire day you spent fixing together the most epic Thanksgiving feast you've ever had. And now you're finally sitting down together to enjoy this special meal you've all created. Past mashed potatoes, green beans, insert your favorite Thanksgiving item. Chatter starts to begin, and then Uncle Tom starts to talk about the latest and greatest in the immigration news. Then your mom starts to chime in, and at first it's still the background noise, but sooner or later the conversation gets a little bit louder to the point where your focus diverges from your mashed potatoes. Now your uncle and your mom are standing up in their chairs, and their nose are almost centimeters apart. The talk goes from screaming, screams go to cry, your mom gets up, the door slams. Now the only thing to cover up this incredibly enormous elephant in the room is Aunt Becky's decision to start dinner, dessert two hours ahead of schedule. <laughs> I can barely see your faces, but for those that I can, I can understand that this has happened once or twice for you. But let me stop hy posing hypothetical thoughts or scenarios and tell you about my own experience. This past winter, I was driving to Tahoe with a friend. And if you've ever done the drive before from here, you know that Google Maps likes to trick ourselves in thinking that's going to be a five-hour drive, slowly turns into six and seven hours and so forth. So we had a lot of time to talk. Among the many topics, politics came up. Now, my friend and I, on almost every issue, I'd say we're on opposite sides of the political spectrum. But no, the story doesn't end with me walking all the way to Tahoe. <laughs> Rather, he said something to me that has stuck with me to this day. He says, June, you know, at this point, I don't even want to listen to the other side. And it's not because I don't want to hear what they have to say or that they may not say something that resonates with me. But it's because when I do share my view and that it's opposing, I'm told I'm a terrible person and that I'm stupid. Politics today have become more about commenting on people's character rather than their ideas. So this got me thinking. 
Why do I feel the way that I do about certain political issues? Much of it is based on my personal experience that I do have emotional ties to. And what about the times when I have been challenged on those certain topics? Have I been one to think differently or comment on someone's character rather than their ideas? And was this something that was maybe controlled by our brains, sort of like a fight or flight response? So this experience with my friend brought me back to times that either I was the giver or the receiver of emotions during political talk. Now this got me thinking. Has anyone else thought about this idea and looked into it? Probably not. Unfortunately, my first reaction wasn't, well, let me share this with TEDxSCU. <laughs> Rather, I am a senior at Santa Clara University and I'm currently unemployed. So I'm thinking maybe this is my shot. I don't have to put my resume into an abyss of nowhere. I'm all set. <laughs> However, you might be able to guess that this is not how this story ends. I am, in fact, still unemployed. <laughs> and while my dreams were shattered for a moment, after I saw and read up on the study that the University of Southern California's Creative and Brain Institute published, I was immediately intrigued by the results and its implications for the way we taught politics. But before I actually get into the study, I want to dive a little bit first into the functions of the brain, how we as humans develop our opinions, and why at times it can be so difficult to sway those stances. So one of the brain's main functions is to ensure our body's survival. And this does this in the sense of setting off physiological reactions such as your heart racing, palm sweating, etc. So this helps our body know that danger is imminent and in fact we do need to act accordingly. So this helps us in situations such as a car is coming at me 50 miles an hour, my brain tells my body, June, move out of the way. Or like our friend Jack Sparrow back here, his brain is telling your body, dude, you actually need to run really fast, this group of people are trying to kill you. <laughs> but the brain is also helping us protect ourselves psychologically when our self feels attacked. It's very well known the extent that we as humans will go to protect our most of these deeply held beliefs. We know words such as confirmation bias when we only look for facts that align with our stances. We also know that even in the face of counter evidence, whether it's credible or not, we're very slow to sway our stances. We all do in fact have that one family or friend that even unless they find this source from their most trusted, credible information news source, they're unlikely to sway their own stance. And if I'm a family or friend of yours, I may be that person in your life. But despite knowing these tendencies, Little research has looked at what's actually going on in the brain during a challenge to political beliefs, until now. So Jonas T. Kaplan, associate professor at USC and colleagues, tried to examine what was actually going on in the brain for political beliefs versus non-political ones. So in the study, they did look at two types of statements, political and non-political. A political statement would include something like, abortion should be legal, or taxes on the wealthy should decrease. A non-political statement would include Thomas Edison invented the light bulb or Albert Einstein is the greatest physicist of all time. So the story went as such. Each participant was given an equal amount of political and non-political statements. The statement would show up on a screen in which participants would rate their stance in this belief from one to seven, one meaning they didn't really believe in it and seven meaning they really believed in it. Then five pieces of counter evidence would show up for about 10 seconds. At the very end, the original statement would come on where participants once more rated their beliefs from one to seven. But the most groundbreaking part about this study was that an fMRI scanner was being used on participants for the entirety of the study. fMRI scanners help us visualize the areas of the brain that are being active during certain activities. So in this case, researchers were able to visualize what participants, the areas of their brain that were active while seeing the counter evidence, but also when they were declaring their final belief stance. So what were the results? Well, it was seen that belief change for, not, for political statements was far less than belief change for non-political ones. In other words, participants were more likely to put aside facts than their own political position. So behind me is the graph of the amount of belief change or lack thereof that occurred. You have your non-political statements in the green, and the purple ones are for the political stances. The lower the bar, the less belief change that occurred. Take a moment to notice how likely participants were to change their stance on Thomas Edison's invention versus someone's stance on gay marriage. But what about what was going on in the brain? Like I said, fMRI scans were being used during the entirety of the study. So we've seen while participants were being challenged on their political beliefs, 
that behind me where you see the red and orange, there's an increased activity in what is known as the default network mode. This region of areas in the brain is known to be active during self-reflection, thinking out someone's past and future, and also think about someone's self-identity. So, in brain speak, when I challenge you on your position on gun control or any other political topic, it's the same as when I'm challenging you as a person. And this is before any insults have been exchanged in the heat of the argument. So merely by challenging someone's political view, our brain is psychologically telling us that we're in danger and we need to act accordingly. For processing challenges to non-political statements, though, there's an increase in activity in the areas that are highlighted in blue and green. These areas are usually active when we are exerting impulse control, response inhibition, problem solving, and flexibility. So even if I told you something as absurd as Dolly Parton invented the light bulb, it's unlikely that this will get you up out of your seat or elicit an impulsive outburst. Rather, you might have actually logically reason why this may be the case. So what is this study telling us? This study is showing us that our political beliefs are connected to our emotions, personal values, and experience, making it really difficult to see how someone could be coming from a different stance. That in the brain, politics are personal. But I also want to make this extremely clear. This is not a sign of defeat. This study is not telling us that political beliefs are hardwired, or that every family dinner has to end in a stream of tears, but rather that this is how we are processing these sorts of beliefs. We are seeing that we are defending our political views in the same way we are defending our character, and that needs to change. Our brain only wants to protect us, but we need to teach it how. We have the control to change our, to have our minds monitor our emotions, to make sure that our emotions aren't affecting the objectivity of listening to someone else's argument, so that we can consciously go into a conversation knowing this, rather than being controlled by it. We need to ask ourselves, Am I letting my self-identity and past experiences get in the way of hearing someone else's view? And I'll be the first to admit, it's very difficult for me to tell someone why I believe in my reproductive rights. I'm a 22-year-old woman who has grown up with three sisters and one sweet, sweet, patient brother. As a young girl, from a very beginning, at times I felt that my self-worth only dwindled down my physical beauty to the point of strictly monitoring my eating and exercise habits. As a person that has woken up from my sleep having unwanted sexual actions by a mere stranger, and their response simply was, oh, I thought you murmured, so I thought it was okay. But stripping ourselves of these emotions is also not what I'm asking. These emotions have motivated groups of people to shake society by the shoulders and tell us that enough has been enough and it's motivated some of the greatest political movements of our time. But by understanding how the brain naturally processes challenges to these sorts of beliefs can help us all ask if and how we are letting the inherent emotional ties affect our political views and also others. And then an opposing political opinion is not meant to invalidate your experience, but is more an expression of their own. But what about on a larger scale? In the democratic society we live in, yes, these individual conversations are crucial and can help us avoid the uncomfortable conversation I tried to induce at the beginning. But this sort of tactic of commenting on someone's character rather than ideas is happening on all levels, both individual, state, and federal, and on all sides of the political spectrum. We live in a country where today we are more polarized than ever, where by merely hearing a political party that isn't your own brings on sheer disgust. We live in a country where in the highest held office, emotional slanders and insults are being published on Twitter and at times applauded. We're also not powerless. We can use the power of our vote to elect those in office that reflect an exchange in ideas rather than insults. So if we continue to understand how we naturally approach challenges to our political views, we can reflect as to why we feel the way we do, but others but ask also why others feel the way that they do. What if this understanding allows us to go into a political discussion with an open mind? What if we can truly mean it when we say, I understand where you are coming from? Which can then actually lead to a dialogue to find middle ground because someone that's of a different view hasn't stormed out of the room. What if we realize that our motivations and foundations of our beliefs are more alike than different? 
And what if maybe, just maybe, next Thanksgiving, we actually started to listen? That's all I have. Thank you.